Uh, right, so the last lecture on terminology and on the introductions to various methods which are out there, we established in the previous lecture that the Hartree Fox state is oftentimes not a very good approximation to the molecular electronic structure, and in order to correct the missing to bring back the missing energy uh, and to bring back the missing uh, parts of the wave function, uh, that is to account for the exchange and to, to account for the electron correlation part of the interactions, what we need to do is introduce uh, the excitations with variable coefficients. So if this is the Hartree Fock reference state, and these are spin orbitals which are populated and these are spin orbitals which are vacant then configuration interaction which we talked about in the previous lecture amounted to promoting one electron or two electrons or more electrons from an occupied orbital to a vacant orbital and then varying these coefficients to minimize the overall energy and because it's computationally difficult to have even one determinant in a big enough system, when we start taking more of them and the numbers grow rapidly, uh, the number of single excitations is already significant in the large enough molecule, the number of double excitations is even bigger and so on, it becomes the total number of the factorial. So the computational complexity of the task grows very rapidly as a function of this excitation levels that we include. We also faced the problem of configuration interaction being not size consistent. That is, in general, if we put two molecules together, uh, even if they are not interacting, the total energy of the system was in general smaller than the sum of the energies of the two original systems. Now, that problem is solved in the so-called coupled cluster theory, which does uh, essentially the same except it doesn't sum over all excitations, all singles, all doubles, all triples, and so on. Instead, it sums over all excitations of a specified type. That is, when we say CCD, uh, coupled cluster doubles, it will sum over all double excitations, over all double excitations of double excitations, and so on. Importantly, as we'll see in the next slide, this is much cheaper computation. And because the summation is carried out to infinity over all excitations of a given type, the problem of size consistency does not arise because when we put the two systems together, there are no further excitations which become available, and so the, task, the problem becomes size consistent in that respect. So how does coupled cluster theory achieve that from just simple Hilbert space theory, we can simply state that if phi zero is the ground state Hartree Fock approximate solution to Schrodinger's equation, and psi is the exact solution to Schrodinger's equation, then there must exist a unitary transformation that takes one into the other, because they're both normalized wave functions. Uh, because it's a unitary transformation, it must have this form, uh, more on that in the spin dynamics course, any unitary transformation is an exponential of some anti Hermitian operator. And when we expand that exponential, we expand it in the powers. And I'm skipping quite a considerable amount of mathematics here, but one can prove that this so-called cluster operator T uh, introduces single, double, triple, and so on excitations into the system. And when we take the exponential of that, we get all possible excitations with the correct coefficients. So coupled cluster theory just truncates this T at single excitations and double excitations, for example. And then when we take the exponential, we get powers of it. And so we have single excitations of single excitations, single excitations of double excitations, but never direct quadruple excitations. And because interactions in electronic structure theory are all pairwise, then this in some sense captures the essential part of the wave function variational space because it is expected that a pair of two particle correlations yeah, and a double excitation of a double excitation 
would be more important than a direct uh, four particle correlation because simply probabilistically it's hard to expect four electrons to collide uh, in the same point, for example, if we're talking about dynamical correlation. So, this coupled cluster theory. Uh, first empirically, and then it was retrospectively justified on theoretical grounds, turned out to be superior to configuration interaction on both the resulting accuracy, so this ansatz turned out to be superior to the configuration interaction ansatz, uh, and on the computational expense. Because if we take a look at um, this, for example, this is T2 squared acting on the Hartree-Fox state, it will promote four electrons from their um, occupied orbitals to the vacant orbitals, but the corresponding coefficient, instead of being a rank 8 tensor, is just a product of rank 4 tensors, uh, and these coefficients are known from the double excitations, and so it is massively cheaper uh, to compute these coefficients compared to all to, to varying every possible coefficient of every possible quadruple excitation. Uh, so, some states would of course be missing, uh, others would be with different coefficients than they would have had with full CI, but empirically, when one checks the numerical results, this works extremely well. Uh, and so, if you're doing configuration interaction, you'd much better off, or you would be much better off doing coupled cluster theory instead. Uh, here's a few examples of the performance. Uh, this is the difference of the coupled cluster energy from the full configuration interaction energy in water in a certain basis. FCI basically means the exact solution to the Schrodinger's equation in the given basis. And so when we do the restricted Hartree fog, of course we are 0.2 Hartree's away. One Hartree is about 2 megajoules per mole, I think, so it's a very considerable energy. So we are talking hundreds of kilojoules of the exact energy. And of course, because chemistry really takes place in the 100 kilojoule range, uh, this would not be very accurate. When we do coupled cluster expansion with singles and doubles um, operators in the generator, uh, we suddenly drop in accuracy, improve in accuracy by two orders of magnitude. So this is in the kilojoule range. If we do CCSDT, this is in the joule range, uh, and so on. Of course, this becomes much more expensive as it becomes more and more complex, but the accuracy improves very rapidly. That's another example, a slightly less dramatic one. As I said, Hartree-Fox theory usually gets the geometries more or less correct, and this is uh, an example of that. If we just do Hartree-Fox in a double zeta basis, we are typically at a 0.02 angstroms, so about 2% away from the X-ray diffraction geometries. If we go to extremely expensive methods uh, like CCSDT, it improves by about a factor of two in the error. So instead of a 2% error, we get 1% error. Uh, the reason for this being that um, these calculations typically are carried out in vacuum uh, or in some model of the environment and they do not exactly capture the crystal structure environment. The other thing they do not capture is the vibrational leveraging that always exists at room temperature and even at low temperatures. And so, it, geometry is an example of a parameter where usually one doesn't actually have to go to very complicated methods to try and reproduce it, and simple things work well. With the energy, of course, uh, one has to, to use a high level method. Uh, on the atomization energy, that's the difference between the energies if you simply tear the molecule apart into individual atoms. Uh, just as expected for the energies, uh, much higher level method produces much more accurate result. So Hartree-Fock isn't even near uh, to the kilocalories, and we see with CCSDT uh, it improves to a range where the accuracy of the calculation starts being comparable to the accuracy of the parameter as you would extract it from the experimental data. So typically in computational chemistry, accurate enough means as accurate as you'd be able to measure it realistically in the experiment. Uh, so convergence with excitation levels, so you can see it improves rapidly for just equilibrium geometry of water. 
it would not be as rapid if we have a very twisted geometry where the original hart fock determinant wasn't a good approximation to start with. So if we are twisting a double bond, for example, uh, the hart fock determinant, single determinant state, will be nowhere near the actual accurate solution. In that case, one has to vary multiple determinants in the original hart fock reference. It's a bit of a black art, so a chemist would be able to point which orbitals are participating in a particular process, but it's hard to automate that thing in general. But various multi-reference methods, you can read up on this separately, must be used instead if you suspect that a single determinant is not a good approximation on which you can start improving subsequent routes and iteration direction. Of course, if it's FCI, then it's accurate anyway, but it's usually prohibitively expensive. So, Bottom line, single reference methods are very accurate if and only if the hart fock state was a, a decent initial approximation. If we have bond cleavage or degeneracies, uh, then, well, it can fail. That's another example of what it takes to uh, recover uh, the energy uh, to greater and greater accuracy. So if we do hart fock theory and then start systematically taking high order and perturbation theory, or configuration interaction, or coupled cluster. Uh, CISDTQ or CCSDTQ typically recover 100%, so for our purposes it's as good as actually solving the full Schrodinger equation. But you can see the difference between configuration interaction and coupled cluster when you don't take it very far. Uh, for singles and doubles, CISD only recovers 96% of the correlation energy, whereas CCSD, which is actually computationally cheaper, recovers 99.7. So, this is usually preferred. An example here of when um, a particular method which is otherwise extremely high accuracy can fail. Uh, CCSDT coupled cluster singles doubles but with perturbatively included triples. You can see as you start pulling the molecule apart, uh, energies should vary smoothly like that. These are the accurate solutions. But the perturbation theory starts diverging at some point, and so the accuracy drops in there. That's the comparison of some geometries, but in rather exotic systems. This is a heavy metal, cobalt, and rather mm, unusual types of bonding. Uh, pie stacking, uh, metal to phosphorus, metal to nitrogen, and things like that. Uh, these are complicated bonds from the electronic structure perspective. And if you look at hart fock for example, for this bond length, it's of course nowhere near the, the experiment, but then the correlated methods like MP2 and CCSD, we'll get to DFT later in the lecture, actually come considerably closer. And MP2, due to a, a bizarre error compensation situation, is in many cases for geometries more accurate than configuration interaction or coupled cluster. So MP2 would typically be the method of choice if you are trying to establish a geometry in that kind of Summary, uh, hart fock can do up to a few hundred atoms, not particularly accurately. The good thing about it is first and second analytical derivatives are available. That is, you get the derivative, at least the first derivative, for not much more than the cost of just the energy calculation. And so geometry optimization can proceed with the quasi-Newton method, which would converge extremely quickly because you've got the gradient as well as the, the energy. Uh, second derivatives are considerably more expensive and they are related to the vibrational frequencies. Because if you take D, D2 energy by d coordinate squared, that's the force constant, the harmonic force constant, that's related to the infrared frequencies that people observe in vibrations of the The complexity is on to the force with the number of orbitals, but this doesn't take into account basis screening. As I mentioned, Gaussians are highly local. If two Gaussians are on the opposite parts of the molecule, for all intents and purposes they don't overlap, all the corresponding integrals, well, okay, most of the corresponding integrals are zero, and so the number of integrals you actually need to take is, in practice, considerably smaller than n to the fourth, usually about n to 2.5 to n cube. So without screening um, in a very large basis set where things usually overlap, uh, even if indirectly, it's all n to the fourth. 
Now, Merle Placid Perturbation Theory and P2, uh, very efficient implementations like the one in travel mode, scale to about 100 atoms for MP2 and about 20 atoms for MP4. For MP2, both first and second derivatives are also available, and so geometry optimizations would proceed quickly. But for MP4, derivatives are usually numeric, which means that for every coordinate, the program would have to take a step forward and a step backward. They're usually central, second order, binary difference derivatives for accuracy reasons, and it would take a very long time. Uh, CICC is D, so singles and doubles, first derivatives are usually there, second derivatives, even in the latest software packages, are numerical. That would be really expensive, because it will have to take numerical first derivatives on the gradients. Uh, and full configuration interaction, even though it uh, is highly desirable, it solves the Schrodinger's equation on a given basis exactly, uh, at least a non-relativistic approximation, uh, three, four simple atoms, like, you know, lithium hydride, and things like that. And all derivatives are numerical, even though, of course, technically speaking, analytical expressions for them might exist, but the programming challenge of implementing them is such that nobody calls them for now. And this is the scaling. And the way to look at the scaling is to consider the cost of doubling the system size. That is, if it scales as n to the fourth, and you've taken the system twice the size, yeah, 2 to the fourth is 16. So the calculation will be an order of magnitude slow. Uh, if it's n to the eighth, it's 256. So the calculation will be two orders of magnitude slow. For the system double the size. Uh, and then this n factorial thing, of course, means that the calculation size completely explodes. So realistically, uh, production grade calculations on systems of practical interest stop about here. If for some reason you need extremely accurate energies, uh, then you can just about reach here at extreme computational expense. And all of this is highly exotic stuff that's only really been tested on diatomics, uh, then published and really used for various validation things, for DFT, for parameterization, and various approximations. It's almost impossible that anybody would require MP6 or FCI for any purposes that an experimental chemist or a theorist in an area other than computational chemistry itself would ever in practice need. Uh, another word of caution, the extreme accuracy I was just talking about only really applies to energies. All other parameters would have their own error compensation situations, in particular geometries, because of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, ignore the fact that nuclei are, after all, quantum mechanical particles with their own probability distributions, that there are zero-point vibrations, uh, even at zero Kelvin. So treating nuclei as classical point charges with a mass is an approximation which is a pretty accurate approximation for many intents and purposes, but at some point the effect is starting to be felt. Uh, I don't think you can quite tell which curve is which, but it's a uh, distribution of deviations from X-ray geometries for uh, a set of molecules. So this vertical line is just the experiment, and this curve, the Gaussian, fits to the distributions that people have obtained with various methods. And to be fair, the most accurate method produces the narrowest peak, but you can see the peak is off center. So even though the random error becomes smaller, the systematic error associated with the intrinsic inaccuracies of the approximations that have been made are still there and cannot be removed. So as a function of basis size, it gets closer and closer and closer. So in this case, it's actually centered on the experimental data, but it might not just as well have been centered. So, beware of error compensation situations, and when you're doing something other than the energy, always check the literature to find out which methods actually work for the property in question, because it's a very big area of computational chemistry, and in particular method validation of it is um, quite extensive. That is, for almost any given method, any mainstream exchange correlation function on any property, 
um, in the case of DFT, as we'll see, there is a paper which runs calculations against a set of experimental data and makes some conclusions as to how well it performs or doesn't perform. So, a summary for the post heart reform method before we move on to DFT is if you want something fast and approximate, uh, use heart reform. If you want accurate geometries or some correlation corrections, use MP2. If you really want extreme accuracy, either use coupled cluster or various composite methods. Uh, these abbreviations you can find out more if you Google for them. But what they do is either do various trade-offs on the integral calculations, like uh, the resolution of the identity method, uh, or they combine all these multiple calculations into linear combinations with empirical coefficients to try and get rid of those systematic errors that I was talking about. So G1 to G3 would compute the same parameter on many different levels, and then use empirically determined coefficients to combine the results into something that somebody has previously managed to fit to an empirical database and found that it improves the results. So, it's a considerable amount of fudge in there, uh, so uh, yeah, be warned. One particular thing that often comes up is extrapolation to the basis set limit. When we do calculations, we typically can only afford a finite size basis set, double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, uh, but certain basis sets have been engineered to offer systematic improvement in the value of the energy, in particular these CCP, V and Z basis sets. And so if we do a calculation for double zeta, triple zeta, quadruple zeta, we can actually try and fitting uh, an asymptotic exponential through them, uh, extrapolated to infinity, and that would be extrapolation to the infinite basis. Uh, it isn't often quite fitting the true basis set limit, but it will get close. It will certainly be uh, massively faster than actually trying to numerically crunch one's way through a 5 zeta basis or something like that. So one particular extrapolant, interpolant uh, here called damming feller extrapolation, uh, you just fit for beta and alpha, and then use this E as the complete basis set limit. Uh, it's a tool that allows, in principle at least when it works, to improve the accuracy. Right, I mentioned gradients on a couple of occasions, and the reason why we want gradients is twofold. First, for the optimization of molecular geometries, we would ideally want to work with energy minimum configuration of various molecules because this is what is there while well, at zero Kelvin at room temperature the situation might be different. But one other thing that we usually want is derivatives of the total energy with respect to various parameters of the Hamiltonian. In particular forces are second derivatives of the energy uh, and so are vibrational frequencies actually related. Oh sorry, forces are first derivatives, vibrational frequencies second derivatives. And magnetic resonance parameters are first and second derivatives of the total energy with respect to external applied magnetic field and the nuclear spin configuration. So it's important to be able to compute those derivatives in an efficient way. And to that end, we've got something called Hellman Feynman theorem, which states this that if we want a derivative of the energy with respect to some parameter of this Hamiltonian, then we need to do this. We need to find the ground state, uh, which is, or, or the excited state of choice, the one that we are looking at. Uh, it will implicitly depend on that parameter. Uh, then we need to differentiate just the Hamiltonian with respect to that parameter and take this integral. The result is the derivative of the energy. There's a proof in the literature, uh, if you'd like to see it, take a look. A second derivative also has an expansion, but uh, you need to differentiate the wave function as well, which is considerably more expensive than just differentiating the Hamiltonian, because in the Hamiltonian any parameter is usually occur linearly. Yeah, it will be a parameter times the corresponding operator, so it just keeps it operating, and things are easy. However, if one needs to differentiate the wave function, it usually depends on the parameter in a highly implicit nonlinear fashion, and so second derivatives for that reason are much harder to compute than first derivatives 
there are various additional assumptions as well as a derivative of the plate function has to have a norm and so on. Densities. Uh, before we move to DFT, this is one of the most uh, frequent parameters that people would like to compute. Uh, of course, simple absolute square of the wave function. We know that it corresponds to probability in Copenhagen interpretation. And so if we take our wave function as a three-dimensional function uh, and compute an absolute square, the result will be the probability density of that particular particle. We can weigh that density with charge, and that would become a charge density for a single particle. However, if we would like to have the total electron, uh, in three dimensions, we would have to integrate over the coordinates of every single electron except one. Uh, because the wave function is fully antisymmetrized, that would make sure that we get the total electron density out, and then we just multiply by the number of the electrons in there. We may want spin density, uh, that is the difference between the probability density of spin-up electron minus the probability density of the spin-down electron. Spin density determines many magnetic interactions in EPR. In particular, the navigable will have to compute spin densities in practice rather a lot. Uh, oh well, we can just multiply the electron density by the electron charge and that will get us the charge density. And here are some examples. This is the electron isodensity surface, so that's the surface of constant total electron density, which is mapped by the charge. So I think red corresponds to partial positive charge and blue to partial negative charge. And it is to an extent informative because if you are looking at where a particular charged reagent will approach and where it is likely to react, then that gives some at least empirical indication as to where it could go. Here is a spin density uh, in some cerium oxide. And you can say from here that, for example, hyperfine coupling in EPR spectroscopy is likely to occur on this nucleus but not on others because all the spin density is concentrated in that place. And there's a charge density map uh, on a silicon surface. And again, from the charge distribution, you can see which parts of that surface are likely to be solvated uh, by water or, or some other polar solvent. So, this charge density, spin density, and other density maps, they serve as a picture to inform chemical decisions. And chemists looking at those can usually make some conclusions about what goes on or might go on in that particular system as it is exposed to various chemical environments. Right, so this brings us to the start of the show, to density functional theory. I guess most of you, even Andreas, have heard about DFT and about the fact that it is much faster than post heart reform methods. Uh, it scales much slower uh, and produces, in many cases, considerably more accurate results than the post heart reform methods, at least when you're lucky. It took a while to develop and it has its pitfalls, but it is extremely good. And Certainly, in our practical calculations, we would usually use DFT. One has to have a special reason to use ab initio methods, so value classic for configuration interaction, and that special reason usually means that DFT doesn't work for some reason. If it's a degenerate ground state, for example, then DFT is not a good approximation, then we'd have to use MCSCF. But for the vast majority of cases, DFT is the method of first choice. It's based in uh, an interesting argument. The basic lemma is that the ground state density of a bound system of interacting electrons in some external potential determines that potential uniquely. Yeah, in principle, you can just compute the second derivative uh, and from the basic laws of electromagnetism determines the external potential. So if we have uh, the ground state density, uh, that means we know the ground state charge distribution, yeah, which is multiplies the density by the electron charge. If we know the charge distribution, uh, we can infer from basic electromagnetism the external potential. 
the cusps in the charge distribution would correspond to the locations of charges of the nuclei. And if we know the positions of the nuclei, and we know the total charge, that is the total number of the electrons, that actually means that we know the entire Hamiltonian. Because the only thing we really had in the Hamiltonian were the kinetic terms, which we know, and the positions of the nuclei, which determine the various electrostatic interactions. So if we know the ground state density, just electron density, three-dimensional object, then we know the Hamiltonian. But if we know the Hamiltonian, then in principle we know everything about the system. Yeah, we can solve for it. So in some sense, it must be possible to reformulate the entirety of quantum chemistry, not in terms of the wave function, but in terms of the three-dimensional electron density. And in fact, uh, that can be done. And Hohenberg and Kohn have proven that there actually exists a well-defined functional we don't know what the functional is. Anybody who finds out what the exact uh, form is will indeed be a hero of mankind. But it, there exists a well-defined function of electron density which attains a global minimum at the ground state density. That basically means that the variational principle has been proven for TFT. So there must be uh, such a functional of the electron density rho which attains the minimum with respect to rho, which is equal to the energy of the exact quantum mechanical ground state of the system. And so we should be able, by varying three-dimensional electron density rather than the wave function, to find that energy. But that's of course a much easier problem. The yeah, wave function was a function of every coordinate of every electron. So if we have 25 electrons, we'd have to have 75 coordinates to look after, it would be a 75-dimensional problem. Uh, it is pretty much insoluble. In DFT, no matter how many electrons you have, it is still a three-dimensional object. So it's the total density. So it's immediately obvious that a solution in these terms would be considerably cheaper, and as the theory goes, no less accurate if we can find this functional, uh, and it certainly exists than the electronic structure theory calculations of the kind that we have seen before. Well, this function must, by uh, basic linearity arguments, have some terms which correspond to kinetic energy. It must have some terms that correspond to internuclear uh, repulsion uh, and attraction of electrons to nuclei. And it must have some terms that correspond to inter-electron repulsion, just like the original Hamiltonian did. And so our energy functional, which we don't know, will then be composed of the kinetic energy functional. It will have a part that corresponds to inter-electron repulsion, and it will have a nuclear attraction energy functional. Of these two, the kinetic energy functional we know, uh, it can be derived. Uh, the nuclear attraction energy functional we also know, it's just a standard Coulomb integral, uh, but the inter-electron repulsion energy functional in a situation where we only know the overall density is something that we do not know. Well, we can choose a basis. Again, the original equation here, as you can see, an integral differential, not very well adapted to being solved on a computer. We don't even know what the corresponding operators are, but we certainly know that they are operators. And so if we choose a basis set, uh, we, we can transform equations that are integral differential into matrix equations, which we can then hopefully solve on the computer. And so what people do is they build the theory in analogy to the hartree fox theory. That is, they declare a bunch of functions uh, which are linear combinations of our basis functions uh, and they expand the density in terms of absolute squares of those functions. So the story goes is let's just find a bunch of orthogonal functions in space and define the density because it's a strictly positive real number as a sum over the absolute squares of those functions. This orthogonality will ensure a nice 
commons of you know, the corresponding matrix equations. Here we ideally would want to work with orthonormal basis sets, of course, uh, and then we can compute this. And this will transform the equation that we've got from the integral differential form into matrix. So, and for single electron orbitals, they can be only called orbitals in quotes because they're not real orbitals. There are these fudge functions which we've simply picked up as a basis. Uh, we can have the kinetic energy term, which is known, and we can have the potential energy term, which isn't known for DFT. We only knew it for the hard Fox theory, but now that we deal with three-dimensional electron density, we don't know what this is. And, well, we can set up Hartree-Fox-style equations for the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of this operator. Potential uh, has a few parts in it. Nuclear attraction is known. Yeah, we just build the density and do the, uh, the Coulomb interaction. Coulomb repulsion uh, is also known. Uh, if we put two charges together, we know how they repel. However, the terms which describe correlated motions of the electrons. Yeah, that same correlation which we had to correct for when we worked with Hartree-Fox theory is uh, first unknown and second it is unknown of a very different kind. We don't even have a guess as to what it might be. In the case of Hartree-Fox theory we knew it. Yeah, we knew what the correction terms are because we just subtract uh, the Hartree-Fox Hamiltonian from the full Hamiltonian and that was it. Uh, in this case, this simply has to be assumed. And this is the famous exchange correlation potential that uh, DFT is all about. Several practically usable approximations exist. Uh, we can say that, okay, we can assume that it depends on just the density itself, but not on its derivatives. The most general possible form of such a dependence is given by this integral. So uh, we'd have the density and we'd have this exchange correlation energy density, which we would simply try and guess uh, and then vary the parameters against experimental data until they fit. Uh, one particular case which is known analytically is homogeneous electron gas. The exchange function is known exactly and correlation functionals are known in several limits and then you can interpolate between those limits. Uh, but, of course, the real-life electronic structure, particularly if it's a single molecule in vacuum and not a solid, is rather remote from the free electron gas. Of course, the gas is uniform, but the real-life electronic structure theory isn't. But, when you actually plug that functional and solve those DFT equations, the result is surprisingly not garbage. So, even the basic, the most simple possible approximation actually, you know, leads to bound states of molecules and bond lengths, which are not kilometers. Of course, this is a very cool approximation which can be improved. Uh, these generalized gradient functionals are still local, but they are, in a way, the next term in the Taylor series. They not only depend on the local value of the density, but on the local gradient of the density. And then, Again, from some physical inspiration, one can try and find the expressions for them. And the huge variety of DFT exchange correlation functionals uh, are mostly of the GGA type. If we include higher derivatives, uh, it will, in principle, well, big enough Taylor series would fit anything, but the parameters do also tend to proliferate, and it's not very clear where to get them from, because empirical databases uh, only record various experimentally measured parameters. In principle, people can fit densities against configuration interaction densities, and this is one of the things that is tried in practice. Uh, and the final type is hybrid exchange correlation functional. It is a mixture, usually a linear combination of uh, LDA, GGA, Hartree-Fock exchanges known exactly, with empirical parameters. So, we'd have some exchange correlation from LDA, there will be some exchange for Fock and LDA, there will be some exchange GGA, there will be some correlation. And this is the reason why DFT does not, strictly speaking, qualify as an ab initio method. Here, yeah, with Hartree-Fock and post-Hartree-Fock, uh, 
we could say that they do not have any variable parameters. Once the geometry of the molecule is fixed, there is no liberty in there. Yeah, we solve the exact Schrodinger's equation, and in the limit of an infinite basis set, an infinite configuration interaction, we get the actual, you know, uh, honest solution of the Schrodinger's equation. In this case, because of the abundance of this, these empirical parameters, uh, DFT is not an initial method. It is, in fact, a semi-empirical method, and uh, it could be viewed as an evolution of the semi-empirics that I've talked about a couple of lectures ago, where there comes a point where you have to draw some inspiration from the experimental data to try and improve the accuracy, because the exact solution is unfortunately out of reach. This is some uh, performance data that I lifted from this paper, uh, listing various functionals. The abbreviations usually refer to the authors, uh, so Becke, Lee, Young, Parr, uh, for example, for Blip. And here's the ab initio reaction barrier, which is obtained with high-level configuration interaction and can be viewed, can be viewed as accurate. Uh, but these numbers are the numbers that DFT returns, and as you can see, it is okay. Uh, these are fairly small barriers, so a few tens of kilocalories per mole, and Hartree Fock would of course fail completely. And the DFT is not miles of the experimental data is good, but it can be a factor of five off, particularly for uh, the low range of these activation barriers. So things like this, uh, really situations where bones are being broken, should be handled with our initial methods rather than DFT. However, geometries is something that DFT really shines at. Uh, there's a bunch of molecules, and that is the performance. The actual table is much longer. Look at the paper if you want to know more. Uh, but this is the standard deviation from the X-ray uh, or uh, from high order configuration interaction in the distance and the angles. So you can see we are uh, a hundredth of an angstrom off in general, so pretty accurate, and a fraction of a degree from the actual accurate geometry. So if your only objective is to get the molecular geometry accurate, then DFT is your best friend. And again, the same warning applies, don't just blindly use B3Lib, because this is what people tend to do in practice, pretty much. Uh, because, well, it's one of the early success stories, it works really well. But it doesn't work really well for everything. Uh, please check the literature for what works best in each specific situation. Uh, more tables, uh, that's the mean absolute error for electron affinities, again, doing reasonably well. Uh, mean absolute error for bond lengths. Uh, later functionals tend to do much better than the earlier ones. Uh, Blip and B3Lib are the relatively recent, well, relatively recent 20 years ago, uh, success stories because they were the first functionals that chemists could actually trust uh, to recover the interesting parameters with reasonable accuracy. Uh, of the very recent ones, M06 is pretty good. Uh, that is the energy deviation uh, for various recent exchange correlation functionals uh, for main group elements, for heavy elements, transition metals, and the average. And you can see uh, they are much lower than uh, the previous ones with a much smaller scatter. Uh, so it's a field that keeps evolving. Unfortunately, it sort of evolves in the wrong direction in that more and more empirical parameters are put into it, more and more fitting is done, and um, less and less uh, real physical insight, uh, well, very arguably, but at least in my view, goes into them. In particular, M06 is criticized for fudging the amount of hard fork exchange. Different functionals in the family have different amounts of hard fork exchange, uh, which are arguably arbitrary. It works in one case, but doesn't work in another case. So, with that health warning, the DFT is very much an empirical method these days. Uh, I guess, uh, is that the last slide? 
Yeah, it is. It is. We finish the lecture. And from the next lecture, we go into practicalities of actually doing things with this, like geometry optimization and computing of the various problems.